Thanks to the stragglers when they come in so that we don't embarrass them much when they come in. Okay. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, we're happy to have uh, Dr. Yusuf with us, and uh, hopefully you'll come many more times today. Again, so welcome to St. Mark's and to the art group. Thank you very much. Thank You're you welcome. very much for having me. Um, so, Krista, uh, so my name is Yusuf. Our, we're going to be talking today about turning stumbling blocks into stepping stones. It's a nice little contemplation and, and concept. Uh, I think it's quite applicable for the start of any new year. But before we get started into actually the topic itself, I wanna to talk to you guys first and foremost about my favorite topic, and that's myself. So I come from a, a background, a very mm -hmm. interesting and diverse background. I practiced chiropractic for about 12, 13 years. Um, I did my education in Australia. I had to sacrifice for my education. I had to go all the way down to Australia. Spend beautiful four years on the beach and in, in, in class. Um, and then after practicing for 10, 12 years, I um, I love chiropractic. Don't get me wrong. I think it's a fantastic profession. I, I was able to see a you know, diverse um, group of people and I was able to help a lot of people, but I didn't find that there was space for God, to be perfectly honest with you. And that was very important for me. If you guys don't know anything about chiropractic, it's the philosophy of the innate that made the body, will heal the body, and kind of all you have to do is you do the adjustment and set it free. Again, I didn't find necessarily the space to talk about God, and I really enjoyed people. I enjoyed speaking to people, engaging with people, and I found that I spent a lot of my sessions, like there were, the adjustment would take 30 seconds, but then the session would last about half an hour because I was just so interested and intrigued about the human condition. So I searched, looked, and whatever, and people said, you know, well, have you tried and, and considered psychotherapy? I said, sure, let's try it out. And if there is a Christian program, that would be great. So some of you here are in the same program that I was in. Stand up to the take a out. Christian counseling is a phenomenal profession to learn and to get into. So I did that as of 2019, September. It's lucky enough to be on campus for the first semester. And then we got COVID and the pandemic shut everything down. And so we went online. Not the greatest thing to develop rapport with humans when that is what you're after, right? But we did, we graduated, we moved on, life goes on, and here we are several years later. My service outside of my professional life, I am involved in the Church of Nativity, which is in Mississauga with uh, Connect, which is a young adult group. They kind of target youth and young adults who have been disconnected from the church, and the aim is to try and bring them back and have them fall in love with the church yet one more time. Uh, another service that I'm involved in is for young married couples, uh, and that is based out of the Church of Archangel Raphael in St. Marina in Burlington. Um, yeah, I did get around to it before. <laughs> so, Saga, Burlington. And that's for premarital and, again, under five years of, of marriage. Just a little bit of a pluck for, for what it is that we're doing. So, that's kind of my qualifications as to why I'm going to be speaking about what I'm going to be speaking about. So we talked about the concept of stumbling blocks and stepping stones. So here comes the audience participation. What do you guys define as a stumbling block? Don't be shy. Yes. Rejection. Rejection. Absolutely. Uh, something that made you go off track. Something that made you go off track. Losing track as a whole. Losing the track as a whole, misplacing it. Okay. That's yeah, that's a big stumbling block. Absolutely. Yes. You're falling into the same habit again and again. Again and again, falling in the same habit. Yeah. Yes. Maybe having tests. Tests from God. Okay. Yeah. That could be a stumbling block. Anything else? Ladies on this side? 
you know, signing time. Okay, so the stumbling block is is generally anything that gets us to pause, to stop, something that derails us off of the path, if you will. And the question that we want to ask is, how do we normally deal when we face a stumbling block? Again, this is another audience participation question. I'm curious, how do we deal? Yes? Find an alternative route. Find an alternative route. That's a good one. He thinks I would have a box. I wrote that. Oh. How do you deal when you're faced with a stumbling block? Yeah. You give up? Yeah, that, that is a possibility. Absolutely. That is how we deal. Yeah. Anybody else? Sometimes you just stop. Get stuck in a circle. You know. You get stuck, and, and that's it. Like you stumble, and, and you're stuck. Yeah. Yes. You scream. And you go for ice cream, or do you, you just keep screaming? Yeah, you scream. Everybody <laughs> screams. <laughs> that's right. So everybody knows when you've hit a stumbling block. Okay, I get it. Break the block. You break the block. Ooh, I like that one. That's a good one. That's a very good one. So okay. So when I said sort of my my background is in, in Christian counseling, I, I wanted to kind of first give you that answer. So if somebody comes into the office and is like, you know, I'm stuck, right? There's something that I'm facing that was unexpected uh, and just gonna be really hard and I don't know what to do. So I'm going to do you like that, that more transition. I worked really hard on that. Um, I'm gonna give you the, the psychology kind of answer as to, as to what we do. We call it cognitive reframing, right? thinking about the problem from a different perspective, right? And whenever we face a situation from like a, a cognitive behavioral sort of lens, we approach it three different ways, right? First, you form a thought about the process, then that goes into a feeling. Without the feeling, you won't have the behavior. But once you have the behavior, you're like, okay, this works, this doesn't work. So you reassess and then you formulate a thought one more time. And then a feeling goes around with it, and then another behavior happens. So that's generally how we deal with things. When we're trying to do cognitive reframing, we want to think about the process in a different way. So we start to challenge the way that we're thinking. Right? That's my job. I help people to challenge what is not helpful style of thinking. So in the thinking realm, here's an example. It's a very good one says, I really don't want to do this presentation. I promise I, I didn't actually put this together. This, this was, was pretty done. So when you're doing cognitive reframing, is you think about it a little bit differently. It's like, you know what? This presentation is an opportunity for me to share my knowledge, okay? Helps you move on to the next step, right? Let's go into like the emotional part of things. I'm really feeling scared and have no confidence. Try and reframe it. I'm nervous, but that's okay. Nerves give me adrenaline that I need to do this. By the way, I, I, I don't normally get nervous when, I, when I'm giving talks, but I, today, I don't know, for, for some reason, I, there was a lot of like palpitations that was happening. I don't know what it was, but I actually did measure my heartbeat. It was 110. So uh, anybody who's in the medical world will understand that's not normal. Okay, so moving into the behavioral side of things is I'm breathless, I fail, uh, sorry, I fail to make eye contact, and seem to be out of control with others. You reframe it, and I'm going to take some deep breaths and focus on one or two people who I know support me. Yeah, behavior, okay, fantastic. Finally, the outcome is I don't handle presentations very well. Okay. And you reframe it as I deliver presentations well when I take the time to prepare and practice. So that's generally how, how we do things in, in the field of psychology, psychotherapy. And that would be a very helpful way. But is there a difference between psychology and Christian counseling? The answer is yes. So we wouldn't be who we are if we didn't bring in and talk about Christ. The conversation goes a little bit differently. So if somebody comes in and they've hit a stumbling block and they come and see a Christian counselor, we start to talk about What's important for us? What's the goal? 
what's the focus, right? Let's face it, the world is full of stumbling blocks. The world is full of pain. It's full of disasters, right? St. Anthony actually said to, used to say to his disciples that live your life as if it was like your last day, right? And it's actually, when you kind of think about it, it's a very morbid. It's a morbid way of, of, of living, right? It's only morbid though if, if this is it, if this is where our focus is, if we are worried and concerned about this world, but if we start to think of this world or what it is as a stepping stone to the next level, as a little bit of training or as a little bit of conditioning for what is really important, right? So if, our, if my aim is, you know, how am I gonna get that nice car? How am I gonna get that nice house? How am I gonna get that, you know, that beautiful bride? Whatever, if that's my focus, and sure, I hit a snag, it's gonna be the end of the world for me. But if my focus is, up there, and that's it for me, right? I start to look at it a little bit differently. My life moves in a different way. My life moves in a different way. Okay, you know what? This is a stumbling block. Maybe, maybe it's a test from God. Maybe it's a temptation from the devil. Maybe this is meant to make me stronger. Maybe this is meant to bring me closer to Christ. Maybe this is meant this, 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 that. So the goal of our life is the most important part on how we can change the perspective of how to deal with the stumbling blocks. Someone will look at this and say, yeah, this is, I, I can't do this by myself. I don't understand. I was a good person and I'm gonna fall and yeah, I'm gonna stop you. Somebody else is gonna look at it and say, <laughs> I can laugh in the face of danger and say, God is on my side, right? And so I'm not really scared about this. And let's go, let's move forward, right? So stumbling blocks can be very effective when you take turn into stepping stones based on what is your goal. What does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible tell us that we're going to have a nice, easy, easy life? No, of course not. So where else would you find information but the book of Sherlock? My child, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials, accept whatever happens to you in periods of humiliation, be patient. I love that one. I love that one. So our perspective is very easily changed by where our focus is, okay? Our perspective. So like we said, that this life is full of many challenges and obstacles. And unfortunately, I think that we have, a, we have an entitlement, right? We feel entitled to have, because I'm a good Christian person, then I must have something. There's the saying of, what is it? Happy, healthy, and wealthy or something like that. So that's, that's generally the expectation. You know, I'm living a good life, right? So I should be successful. People will see that's a good Christian person by this level of success that I have. I'm happy. I'm not constantly mopey and sad. People are going to think, oh, yeah, that's a very good Christian. That's a very good Christian. As a, as a, as a youth, I used to hear this all the time because, you know, I was a very broody kind of a youth. I used to hear that, you know, Christians back in the old day were identified by the smile and the joy that was on their face. Okay, well, that's not great. That's fantastic. I don't feel like smiling at the moment. Anyways, so entitlement for, for that happiness. And then wealthy, obviously, you know, if you're successful, if you're a doctor, if you're an engineer, if you're a lawyer, if you're this, if you're this, or that, and your bank account is in, you know, has an extra couple of zeros than everybody else, then you must be a good Christian, right? We're entitled. We feel that that is our right. What is it? Right? We, we go back. Whenever you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trials. Right? It's not meant to be easy. When things don't go our way, when those boxes aren't almost like auto-ticking themselves, we feel that 
God is, you know, he's not really focused on us. He's not really in it for me, right? He's not supporting me. He's not, he's bullying me. He's picking on me. He's, you know, he's forgotten about me. Those are the general feelings that people have when things don't go their way. If I pray for something really, really, really hard, I really, 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 really want it. I took it and I placed it on that altar and, and you know, I was waiting and I said, okay, you know, it's been like, you know, 72 hours, where's the answer for this? And it didn't come. Or it turned out to be exactly the opposite of what it is that I've been praying for. God is not. God is not kind. God doesn't care about me. And that, in the field of psychology, we call distorted thinking. Distorted thinking has to do with the thoughts that we have that don't necessarily match reality. How is this? How can we challenge the fact that God has forgotten about us? How do we challenge the fact that God doesn't care about what I want? Somebody tell me this. Take it on a different turn. I think sure. if you go to a child, yeah, God is actually there, but when he's not, then Satan is saying, let me leave him alone, so God is far away from me. So I think it's another way around. I like that. Can you repeat it one more time? Because I don't think they've heard you over on that. Wait, hold on. So I think the other way around, when you're in trials and when you face difficulties, it's actually God is with you and Satan's not happy. But when you're left alone, life is calm, everything is fine, then Satan is saying, well, you're far away from God. I don't need to bother by putting you in trials or pushing you. Did you guys hear that? Yeah. So... And I was looking at trials as the measure of how deep your relationship with God is. We're going to get into that in a few seconds. But I just want to challenge the thought that God has given up on us or has forgotten about us on a more superficial level in that we're here. Right? We're here. And we're here not as, well, we're not here as a mosquito or a little fungus, right? Like an afterthought of creation. I'm here as a son or daughter of the Almighty. He has thought enough about me to create me. He has thought about me enough that I was lucky to be born into a Christian family. He has thought about me enough so that's how we challenge these distorted thinking. It's like, look where you are. Look at the privilege that you have been given to be born who you are, when you are, and what you are. So again, the change in the perspective of these stumbling blocks, right? I am son of God. So then these stumbling blocks are nowhere able to knock me down. That's one. Two, they must be here for a reason. Because everything that happens, happens by his will. We can easily, from that perspective, move into what we just prayed five seconds ago in the Thanksgiving prayer. To say, Master Lord, God the Pentecostal, Father of Father of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for every condition concerning every condition and in everything. You mean we can be thankful for illness? Yes. We can be thankful for poverty? Yes. We can be thankful for pandemics? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We definitely can be thankful for it all. It is on something worse. Tell me more. It is on something worse. What does that mean to you? Uh, like a, a 
Sorry, I'll just say hi real quick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, Father came in. I go way back. Um, I'll wait to see you. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. It could be worse, or it's the half full kind of analogy, because if who knows. Right? Only God knows, right? If I had that money, if I had that, if I was a millionaire, maybe I would be a horrible human being. And I, and I would make more mistakes. And I would step away from God. I would step away from the path that he has for me. Right? Maybe if I if I was healthy, you know, I'm, you know working on my six pack. If, 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 if that was the case, you know, I'd be like, Conceited, I would be like, you know, like, I don't need to talk to you, right? Again, step away, fall off the path. So I can be thankful for all of these things. Now, it's a good thing that when we're trying to change our perspective or trying to overcome things, is that our life has been blessed with so many different examples. Right? You pick up your Coptic reader and open up to that Synaxarium, and it is every single day there is an example of somebody who overcame an obstacle and used it instead as a stepping stone to end up there. There's wonderful, wonderful experiences, wonderful examples for us. But the most important example would be we look up to all the time, right? I like to, what would Jesus do, right? But what did Jesus do, right? When we talk about obstacles, talk about God Almighty condescending and becoming a human. That's the biggest limitation that, you know, we could you know, bestow upon. Him. That's like you taking up residence in an ant farm. Not only that, was that an obstacle? Do you do you think that that, that would have been an obstacle? I would I would see it as an obstacle, but he turned it into a stepping stone. He turned it into a stepping stone to take us to a completely different place. He was born in a manger. Was that an obstacle? Yeah. It was from Nazareth, right? Was anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah. He elevated Nazareth and put it on the map. By just being there, another stepping stone. He was betrayed by Judas, right? The man who ate and drank and dipped his bread in the same cup as him. That's a big obstacle. Who do you trust after that, right? But he showed us stepping stone. He was tortured, obstacle. He was whipped. He was crucified, obstacle. He died. Buried, raised, that was his destination. So the example that we use here is, it's not just about changing the perspective of what these obstacles are meant to do, and that they are stepping stones for us, but also to use the example here is to say, I'm not losing focus of where I am going. I'm not losing focus of where I need to be. I trust that God placed me here for a very specific reason. And okay, so I'm going to share something a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say that you know, like I'm going to use myself as an example here, but I, it's a it's an important story. It's an important chapter in my life, and without the full trust in, in God, I would have been not here today. So um, in 2019, 
I, I was diagnosed with cancer, lymphoma. Um, incidental finding, I, I, I have Crohn's and I had an obstruction, ended up in the hospital and they called and they said, listen, we found some like bulky nodes. We need to get that assessed. We got it assessed. Lymphoma stage four. Okay, now great. What do we do? This is nothing. So what do you mean nothing? I said this is a this is a slow growing kind of a cancer, so you don't really need to do anything about it. There's no symptoms that you're having, so we're just gonna observe. So they observed. They observed for about a year. Then about a year later, symptoms started to occur. All right, now let's do some treatment. They started treatment. I turned out to be anaphylactically reactive to the actual treatment that they wanted to give me. So they tried to treat me, tried to treat the cancer three times, and three times I ended up in the hospital for secondary symptoms of a reaction that they were going to kill me. Obstacle, right? That was a big obstacle. Uh, that was the only medication that they wanted to give me because they didn't want to do chemo. This was something separate. All in the back of my mind, I'm kind of laughing. I'm like, so first of all, okay, you got cancer. Start thinking about your life. And then now, let's do the treatment, but now you're allergic to this treatment. Okay, what's next, right? Just kind of sitting there and laughing. And the doctors, they're like, this guy doesn't get it. He has no idea what's happening to him. He has no idea how close he is to death. So I got referred to Princess Margaret. And uh, the day that I arrived in Princess Margaret, they kept me waiting for about an hour in the waiting room. And my wife was sitting right next to me and she's like, something is off, something is wrong. You're gonna like die in three days time. I, I just, I have a bad feeling as to why they're keeping us waiting. Again, God's providence. So I walk in to the doctor's office, finally after an hour, and they say, we have good news. So great, I don't have cancer. They're like, no, you have cancer, and it's very serious, and you're like in the 0.1% of population that is actually like allergic to this medication. So that's not the good news. The good news is today we got the approval for a clinical trial that we think would be phenomenal for you. You know, okay, clinical trial. You know, I see some faces that are like in the medical world and they understand, you know, clinical trial. Again, laughing in the back of my mind. I'm like, you kept me waiting, right? And so it's funny because a few years ago, I was the most impatient human being on the face of the earth. I was I'm like, God, give me patience now, right? That was my, that was my prayer. So I was working on my patience. So we started the treatment. And the treatment was literally, they took out six liters of my blood. Again, sit very patiently without moving your body for six hours while they do what they're doing. And then they inject one mil of what they've distilled back into your body. Okay, that's the treatment. And then I had to be admitted into the hospital for two weeks for observation. This is a clinical trial. You know, it's a big thing. They need to know if I'm going to like spontaneously combust or something. So the first week passes by, and nothing, no symptoms. When I first got admitted, I was in a private room. Again, it's COVID, lots of issues, lots of problems to kind of just even find a, a, a bed into, into the hospital system. Um, after the week passed, I'm like, okay, there's nothing. This guy's really boring. Nothing's going to happen. The doctor even thought that Maybe they gave me a placebo, and I'm like, was that even a possibility? They're like, no, no, no. But we had to just double check to make sure that we knew the right thing. They were expecting some kind of a response, right? The week passes by, and I said, listen, you're fine. We don't really need to keep you in isolation. We're going to put you in a semi private room. Again, and I'm like, it's just the circumstances of things are just so odd and so weird to me. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening, you know, whatever, God, your mercy, whatever, your grace, just give it. So I ended up in the semi-private room. And the first night, I had no roommate. The second night, a 75-year-old Italian mafia dude gets me open. And I genuinely do use the term specifically as mafia because that's exactly what he looked like and what he sounded like. 
first he showed up into the room with his like old stash of like medicinal ingredients and was trying to convince me that any and all of the pain medication that the hospital was about to offer us were like what and I should like partake in whatever it is that he bought in his like plastic Tupperware bag or whatever. Anyways, and he's like, you know, I, he just would be on his phone and he would like tell so and so on the other side to smarten up or else he's going to send his cousins to pay him a visit. And I'm overhearing this like in the semi private room. And I'm like, God, please, <laughs> if the cancer doesn't get me, <laughs> I, I'm not going to smile wrong at this guy. And at that time, was really fascinated by Coptic iconography. And not that I'm a good artist or anything like that. I found a, 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 an artist from the UK who was like really like phenomenal at it. He even like posted a couple of videos on, on YouTube as to how to, to do, to write a, a proper Coptic icon. And I said, you know what, I would love to do that. So before going into the hospital, I brought like a little like, art sketchbook and I brought like a protractor and because if you know anything about Coptic iconography it's all like geometry based so I got a geometry set and I'm super excited the video was 20 minutes long right it took me 12 hours to just finish the one the one thing anyways again these little incidences mean absolutely nothing by themselves but when you put them all together the guy comes up to me and he's like you seem religious <laughs> Where are we going with this? He's like, I used to be Catholic. Well, like, oh, okay. <laughs> He's like, but well, we had to leave the church because the priests, they tried to marry off my sister to a gangster and it didn't work. And they talked badly about my family and left on not such good terms. And I just hate it. And I, and I, and I, you know, I said, well, that's, that sucks. That's, that's terrible. That's, I can't imagine that that, that would be horrible. Um, and he's like, so what do you make of this religion business? <laughs> I'm like, um, what? And he's like, what do you think? He's like, you seem to be religious. I'm not. We're both here suffering in the same room with cancer. Well, what do you make of it? And then all of those little instances of that didn't work, that didn't work. Move you out from the private room into a semi private room. It all started to click. That was it. I was there for this guy. That night, we actually spent speaking up until like 10 p.m. And to the point that the nurses, they're like, you both have like cancer, go to bed, get some rest. And we talked. We just, there was nothing, and nothing was planned, nothing was said that I could attribute to my intelligence or my theological prowess or whatever, but it was all but the grace of God. And I do remember the one sentence that I said to him. I said, it's all noise. The only thing that matters is your relationship with him. Today, this guy is actually still alive, is back in the Catholic Church, and once in a while, he messages and says, hey, hope you're still doing good. And I, I no longer have cancer. Like, that was the reason for what I went through. If I had thought about it for once as this is the obstacle that's going to end me, this is what's going to Get me to stop believing. Why would he let me get it? Why would I suffer with this and have to go through all of that? But if it wasn't for that one person, I'm very happy that that's what happened. That he put me in that position, in that place, that I can just talk to one person. So, what would you do? Everything that we do must be to emulate Christ. 
We can't look at these obstacles and say, by my own will and might, am I going to be able to overcome? We look at everything with full humility. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Humility isn't, oh no, it's okay, go ahead. That's false humility. Humility isn't weakness. Humility isn't, I need assistance. Humility is knowing full well that I have the capacity to do this. But I choose to relinquish that and rely solely on his grace. Only then will those stumbling blocks just melt away into this beautifully paved road of stepping stones for you. And I'm just going to end very quickly on my absolute favorite verse. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Everything, everything that happens is for our benefit. When you go to confession and you sit with a wound and, and he says to you, you need to pray. And you say, I pray. And he says, we need to pray some more. It's not because God misses your voice. He knows what you sound like. Right? That's not what it is. But the prayer is for you. It's for me. Everything that I do, everything that faces me, is to make me the better and best version of myself so that I can meet him in the best possible way. Do we have to do all of this alone? Do we have to take it up on our shoulders to say, I got it, I got it, humble, check, got it. Seeking help. It's okay to ask for help. But again, from a counseling perspective, you gotta check your boundaries. Who are you asking for help? You know, you're not going to the cashier and the shoppers and saying, I need some help with, you know, something. What are the boundaries, right? So who are you asking for help? First and foremost, obviously, the father of confession. Somebody who has known you, hopefully, your entire life. And if you've changed your father of confessions, you've changed father of confessions. And if you're going to go the other route of seeking some other help or care, Christian counseling, I guess, is the best way to go. Right, Abuna? Shameless promotion. Right? Christian counseling. And I, I love this little t-shirt. I think they, they, they sell them on the internet somewhere. It says, it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist, too. So, that's it. Questions, comments, concerns, opinions. I think so. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Do you have that t shirt?